What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 79 of the Noise Podcast, brought to you by Noise Card UK and sponsored by Stereo Brain Records. I am your host, slash your boy, Chris Pugh, and as ever, I'm joined by my very good friend and Mr. Cynical himself, Samuel Lewis. Mate, how are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Summer is coming to a close, which is sad, um, but I'm, I'm actually kind of looking forward to getting back in the routine of work. But other than that, all is well. On our last episode, I was saying that on our next episode, i.e. this one, we would be going back to work like that week and that we might be in, uh, our spirits might be <laughs> substantially lower than they had been two weeks prior. How are your spirits on this uh, on this <laughs> Tuesday, the 31st of August? <laughs> are they substantially lower or, yeah. um, or more than? Uh, my spirits are okay, although um, directly after this podcast, I do have to go buy some work clothes um, uh, and, do, right, and, okay. and buy some stationery. And have those to have that kind of shopping trip, um, and then I'm just gonna just gonna gonna chill and try and escape the um, the, the growing feeling of misanthropy that always accompanies uh, the return to work. The thing is, though, I really like my job. I really yeah. love my job. I love working with the kids, but I can't help but always feel the night before, the couple of days before, this tingling feeling of like. No, it's like nerves and dread and and like kind of kind of excitement and all those sort of things. Because the build up of being away from away from it for so long and now that it's gonna be incredibly busy when, when you sort of get back, um, it's hard to escape those feelings. So my spirits are, are lower, lessened certainly, but not substantially. I think I think I'm gonna be able to push through it. How are yours? Yours is yours is your big big year for you coming yeah, up, man. It's a big year for me. My spirits are sound if it wasn't for the fact that I'm so incredibly ill, which if people who are listening can probably tell by the way my voice sounds and also the way I look. Um yeah, man, I, I since last Props since we to went you out for keeping the video going right now, yeah. man. Like it's some bravery going on. There, since man. we went out last uh, last week in Nottingham, man, I've had um it's it, it, I'm not like rolling around like I can't get out of bed, this sucks. It's just you know that constant like fuzz feeling in your mind. I've took yeah. several. I've took several lateral flow tests and they're all negative, so I know it's not COVID. But like you know, you, you, your brain feels fuzzy. Your eyes feel heavy. Your nose is constantly yeah. running. It's a pain. It only seems like it's a pain. And it, what, could I think of a worse time for it to happen? Because I know on Thursday, first day back, it's going to be a hundred mile an hour, and I haven't got time to blow my nose. Do you know what I mean? I've got. <laughs> I've got 50,000 things I need to be do some, before blowing my nose. Some, some woman running the, 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 the tissue shranny course. You'll be grabbing a tissue there, would you, Mr. Pugh? <laughs> you got any more pens in your hand, can you? Brilliant. <laughs> Honestly, mate, that's like, it. Sorry. It's just like snot pouring down your nose as you're taking notes on a lecture that's never ending. Exactly that, that, bro. Exactly that. Look, so we, me and you, like, we make out that we don't love our jobs. We, we very, very, very much love our jobs, yeah, man. Absolutely. But, but I'm in the same I'm in the same kind of category as you because you, your brain gets into this false sense of security, right? Where six weeks away from work, your brain gets used to the idea of what do you mean I've got to wake up at half past six? I'll wake yeah. up at ten o'clock, like I've woke up at ten o'clock for the last six weeks. Do you know what I mean? Your brain just falls it falls into that kind of pattern. Uh, so it, it, the, the idea of moving that my brain backwards three and a half hours, especially when feeling like this. Is is something of a daunting task. Let's see, even when I'm at work, my brain doesn't turn on until like midday. <laughs> like, I'm teaching first period in autopilot, man. And then it's like I wake up like halfway through like some speech on Shakespeare. It's like I'm fully conscious again. It's like being born. It's incredible. Come eleven um, o'clock, I... you all automatically remember what a compound sentence is. You're like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I just see like superlative definitions just floating Amazing. around me and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I'm with you, man. This is a rock and metal podcast, believe it or not, uh, sponsored by Stereo Brain Records. We hit you every fortnight, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Basically, wherever you get your podcasts, we will be there. The best way to support us is by subscribing, slash liking or following, depending on whatever service you are using. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Noise Podcast. Both me and Sam run that account. On this week's show, there really, really isn't much going on in terms of news, or at least in terms of news that I'd like to discuss with Sam. So instead, we've got album reviews from Carcass, Aborted, and Turnstile. Plus, we have a, but you will see by the title of this episode, we are returning to guest interviews. We felt very guilty two weeks ago for not including a guest interview. So today, we have Tommy Rogers from Between the Buried and Me. And it was also completed by Sam. Only his second ever interview. I've only heard slip snippets of it. Uh, it's, it was great from the snippets I've heard because I haven't edited it fully yet. Sam, give our listeners an insight into what that interview entailed, please. 
Um, the first 10 minutes of me just shouting, how do you do this? At him. <laughs> fair, and just fair. being like, I, I don't really know. We just sit around and, and write stuff and this is what happens. Um, it's actually it's actually a really nice conversation that, that we ended up having with him, discussion on, on, on the album, on the history of the band, on the, the, the changing face of prog metal and a little bit elsewhere, like how, he, how they cope with stuff on tour um, and Michael Jordan somehow. Um, Amazing. I, knew get I, I can't. I, I haven't. I haven't met. I haven't met a different. I haven't met a new person at all in the last three years that I haven't managed to sneak uh, MJ into the last conversation. So it, it makes sense that I would also talk about it to a to the lead singer of a prog metal band. Brilliant for a podcast. So, but um, yeah, it's it was it was a great conversation. This guy is a genius musician, part of an incredible band. Their album is fantastic. If you haven't heard that, and this was this conversation was a further in on that on how that process has come together, really. I said there was no news that I wanted us to really go into. Quick mention now, every time I die's new record, Radical, is out on October 22nd. That is going to be, I could tell you right now, mate, that is going to be in my album of the year listing. There is no band I trust more than every time I die. I, I actually think they've got a shout to be the 21st century's best band in the sense of literally every record they've ever done has been an 8 out of 10 at least. Like... They are they are ridiculous. They're a, a, such an amazing, amazing band. So I'm concrete certain that Radical will make it into at least my album of the year listing. Um, obviously for yourself, we'll have to wait and see because I, I, I think like I'm fairly more familiar with Every Time I Die than you. But I, I think that, ugh, mate, I just that they're amazing. That album will be amazing, and I, I'm just absolutely certain it's going to appear in at least my album of the year listing. The other album of, of note, just quickly, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, Wage War, they've got an album called Manic out on October 1st. Um, Is it Never or Never for Wage War? Like, if it doesn't... Because we mentioned them a few... We were t- I forgot what album we were talking about a few weeks ago where I mentioned them. And I was like, oh, do you remember when Wage War were really good? Or, Sleepwalker. Or Sleepwalker, that was it. Sleepwalker, Sleepwalker alias. Sleepwalker, not Walker, by the way. Um, me, again, me and you saw them and we were like, wow, like this is great. And they're, they're, they had this real like surge of momentum behind them. And that's kind of died down. And Sam, do you feel like it's like if this album doesn't really bang, it's going to be never? Yeah, they're going to go from, um, I hope the next Wage War album is going to be good to Do You Remember Wage War? That is, yeah. that is going to be the shift that starts to take place. Uh, the last album was okay. Yeah, it was all right. Um, but they, they, but they, they they certainly overdid the melodic element to it. It kind of diluted the rest of it. If they get this right, they're right back in the conversation because they've got a lot of cachet built up in the industry already. So I'm optimistic. I think we should probably review it. It's worth having oh, a conversation and talking about. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's a lot to look forward to this year. Like I was I was I was tweeting about in the noise podcast. I have discounting a couple of great EPs reviewed as well this year. Yeah. But I have at, I have at least fifteen full albums that are like strong considerations for an album of the year list already. And it's yeah. August the thirty first. And I've I have no doubt that the next podcast is probably going to have another two or three yeah. that I'm probably going to be considering. And and that's the, and that's that's including albums we've not even managed to talk about on this. On this pod yet, like like Phineas, like Teenage Wrists, yeah, um, yeah, like yeah. like Lifeblood, um, like you know what I mean. There's like the whole host of stuff going on. It's 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 a really wonderful time for music. You you were saying to me the other day we were talking about it, and you were saying you know we always talk about being born in the wrong decade. Do you think that we weren't? And I'm actually starting to agree with you. I used to I used to grow up thinking, well, what it wouldn't be great to be like 20 in 1990. Um, and then Master Puppets came out when you were 16 and the Black Album came out when you were 21 and then the whole 90s thing with all metal and stuff. But now I'm thinking with the availability and ease in which you can access music coupled with where metal is right now, we're, we're approaching, I think, another sort of golden age. I just, people won't talk about it in the same way because like, the charts aren't there. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And, and we're yeah. not in that 80s rock festival thing where like, Ozzy Osbourne's like a massive rock star. Do you know what I mean? Bands aren't in the public eye as much. But in terms of like, if you're a hard metal fan, we are we are really having a hot bed at the moment, which is just a wonderful time to be, to do to do the work that sort of we're doing. It's a wonderful time to be around. Mate, you just made an absolutely amazing point there that I've never actually thought about before. If, that's such a good point. If, I never know what point it was. I no, no, you. if the influx that we've currently got of like this incredible run of metal records was taking place at a time where 
there were also superstar acts in metal that were in the mainstream. We, I think, we'd be recognising them as the greatest period of metal potentially ever. Like, I, I don't, I don't know this, but was the eighties as consistently brilliant as these last three years? I no, don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I think. I, I, look, man, like I, I'm not going to pretend to know every single band that was massive in 1988. Of course, but, of course, yeah. But I, I, I would hasten to suggest if you took a list of the the 20 biggest metal bands of 1988, right? After Metallica, Megadeth, Sepultura, Slayer, um, and Anthrax. a few like... So, yeah, Anthrax. Um, and a few of those, Pantera. The, take that lot out. Is the seventh best metal band in 1988 as good as the seventh best metal band in 2021? Because I reckon I could get through like 25 great metal bands, right? That mean you could just... We could we could do this for ages, actually. We could just list great metal bands that have been around in the last three or four years. I think we'd get to a point where it was like, are they good until like 50? Yeah, and I don't, that's I just a good don't point, the, man. I don't think the depth is there. But I also think if you're in 1988, Chris, how are you finding um, Sleep Token in 2019? No. Who's, who's, yeah. who's, where, where, where are they appearing? Like, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you, maybe you're reading a snippet about them in, a, in, in an article. Maybe someone hands you a cassette tape. You hear them on the radio. Like, bands just have to tour their asses off to actually just you have to physically see them and then hunt them out. Um, do you know what I mean? Even even Metallica weren't getting like a we didn't have an MTV music video until 1989. Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 tougher. Uh, so I, I think that's contributing as well. Like and 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 the, the work that we're doing on, on on social media and interacting with these bands and things like that. Like if 1988, me you were doing a podcast or something yeah. like like or do like a radio show in like our bedrooms in 1988. We're not getting a, a member of between the buried and me or what the equivalent is for 1988 to sit in our living room and talk no, about no. his favorite favorite bass lines or whatever it's just not it's just not happening the, the the access the relationships are just so much easier to to get across like you look the other day and i'll stop this tangent in a minute i promise no don't um, carry on da, dan dan hillier is a massive fan of the band sugar horse and he's yeah. been they're, they're a tiny little band that came out near him in bristol yeah. that he's been promoting for like two years and he wrote he writes articles about him talks about him on twitter and they came out the new album's really good i haven't heard it but i, I trust his judgment and they have a conversation they share his ideas they share his articles they have a conversation about it when they tour i'm assuming you'll get a press pass but that just doesn't happen mm. in 1990 it just i yeah. just absolutely absolutely doesn't unless you're the sort of person that would you just turn up to gigs and just try your luck and things like that we're not we're not in that in that world so i do actually to bring it right back to our current conversation i think we are living in a real real hotbed and i just think the fact that trivium aren't as big as iron maiden were in 1989 means that people don't aren't seeing um metal and rock with the real the real fantastic um development that it has because the talent is just abundant at the moment it is just superb everyone wants to be 18 right when slipknot's debut album comes out Everyone wants to be like an adult and, and see that happening. Everyone wants to be 15 when Dookie comes out by Green Day. And I think that's where me and you, that's where me and you said before, me and you might have been born in the wrong decade. But like to the point where I mentioned to you the other day, maybe we weren't because we would look at this ridiculous run that we're getting of metal right now. And you just really confirmed the point in my head that actually I don't think we were born in the wrong decade because, mate, our next podcast in two weeks is reviewing. The new Iron Maiden record, which is out this coming Friday, 3rd of September. The new Rivers of Nile album, the new Employed to Serve album, and the new Sleep Token album. I mean, please. I mean, it's amazing. Podcast. Yeah, yeah. Spoiler. And I've got an interview that I've already completed that I can't say who it was with yet to put on that. So that, that is going to be the long, probably longest podcast we've ever done. But just to accent your point there, mate, we weren't born in the wrong deck, I don't think. This is a really, really special time. For, for metal, I mean, I, I I don't think I've I can think of a year where just into if we just like kind of condense the argument down to specifically deathcore, an album as good as Lifeblood by Brand of Sacrifice, but also we've had Asaya and Cognitive and Lorna Shaw's album and Humanity's Last Breaths album, and we've got Volvadinia coming out as well. What is happening? This is cra- This is crazy. We've got Signs of the Swarm coming out as well. What's going on? This is the wildest thing ever. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The, the 
the genre the genre has widened to, to such a degree now where if you like a if you like a niche genre like hardcore or you like a niche genre like death metal or like melodic death metal or even progressive death metal there's like 15 really good bands now yeah in, in that in that niche let alone the whole the whole umbrella think of think of think of the bands that we've reviewed over the last two or three years while doing this podcast what percentage of them would you say that we were like no because i think it's like like 50 60 percent now yeah yeah bands are either bringing out like their first major album or they're first onto the scene or they're the sort of band that have been bubbling under the surface for four or five albums and now they've sort of they've sort of pushed themselves into the public eye you know um and and this is this is just another another example of that and having having the platform here to be able to to talk about it to review it and and put it in context of the genre as a whole is 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 a privilege because i think if we're doing this in 2010 we're talking about metalcore every week yeah and you know hypothesizing on what bring the horizon are going to do next and and things like that um and that's and that's kind of that's kind of where the genre is but now we are it just wading through um just a slew of of great metal bands in a variety of places like me and you talk about all these albums i can regardless of what person i find that likes rock or metal music there's like a couple of albums i've got in my head that i want to recommend to that person regardless yeah, of who yeah. that they are and that sort of expand that like we always talk about oh there's, a, there's guys that we love that are into prog metal and they would love x album and people over here love like death metal and they, they love that and this person's a really big hardcore or punk fan they love that and that sort of stuff and there's these pop punk fans that would love x album and it's it's just it's just terrific to be able to do that and that's how those connections are being formed and Mate, it's just a, it's a great time to be around to do this job right now. Absolutely is, man. By the way, shout out to Dan Hillier. He's an amazing writer for Noise. Um, he is. And Incredible. He's a, he, is, he is a, a fantastic, fantastic supporter and purveyor of uh, young and upcoming bands, such as Sugar Horse. Absolute shout out to Dan Hillier. Uh, Sam, Thanks, you mentioned earlier about bands that were massive and brilliant in the 80s and big for metal. One of them was Carcass, Sam. Yes, yes. Carcass probably would be the seventh best metal band in 1988. They... You know what, mate? They probably were. Probably right around where they are, yeah. So, Carcass, Torn Arteries, new album out on September 17th via Nuclear Blast. It is the band's seventh album and the follow-up to 2013's Surgical Steel. Uh, side note here from me. Surgical Steel, from what I've read, uh, is considered one of the great metal comeback albums. Even Pitchfork loved it, Sam. Uh, Pitchfork, who, from all the times I've like yeah. read Pitchfork articles, they are like the harshest... <laughs> They're the hardest critics in the world. I think I think they gave the Black Album like seven point seven, if I remember correctly. Something something along those lines. Like Pitchfork are the harshest critics, and and in some ways that's great because you know if you hey, if you got a high scoring album on Pitchfork, they really love that stuff, man. So, um, I think Surgical Steel got like an eight point two or something like that from Pitchfork, which is you know that's like never mind <laughs> do you know what i mean i was like wow i can't believe they've scored it this high it's crazy um so regular listeners to the show will probably be aware that my love of classic death metal has only really been relatively recently stoked um a few months ago i decided to go back through it and listen to the classics and what an amazing time that was and that means that really in terms of carcass i'm only really familiar with hard work which has to be said what a phenomenal, seminal, ridiculous, incredible album that is. When was the last time you listened to Heartwork, Sam? We're talking relatively recently or years and years yeah. ago? Yeah, I listened to it because I, I, I had a few tracks on my Spotify for like a few years, but I never actually listened to it from start to finish. So I put it on my MWE um, for myself. Oh, man. So the, I, listened to, I listened to Heartwork whenever the MWE was. That feels February. like a year and a half ago. Yeah, February. Yeah. Um, and then... And then I've since revisited a little bit in sort of build up for this album. Heartwork should be considered alongside Slaughter of the Soul. And, yeah, man. And symbolic in terms of like um, death metal, in terms of some of the songwriting. He's just absolutely extraordinary. Um, and Carcass are one of the more well-respected bands in metal, really, over the last 20 years that haven't really diverted from their, uh, from their identity. And yeah, they went away and they came back. But this is a superb band. This is a Mate. superb band. I'm at... Like, I suppose it's kind of difficult for me to say that I think they're an amazing band, considering I've only I only really know one of their records. But if I'm gonna if you're gonna know a Carcass record, it might as well be Heartwork. To be yes, fair, because it's, it's 
it's absolutely it's like it is really their it, it's their absolute kind of it's, that's their landmark release right that's the one yeah. that if you search carcass on google it's going to be hard work that comes up so with that said i've this torn arteries is the second carcass record i've ever listened to in full and i'm i'm coming into this with the perspective of <laughs> Jim and I used to say to you before, and I've made the argument loud times on the podcast that like my kind of idea was after a certain point, just stop doing records, just don't bother anymore. One of your worst takes, I'll be honest. I've got to be honest, Sam. Uh, at the gates, Cannibal Corpse and Carcass this year have really stuck the middle finger up at me and, and proved that that is one of my worst takes because with Nightmare of Being, with Violence Unimagined, and with this. That is three bands that have been going for 20 plus years and all three are brilliant records. Like the nightmare of being by At The Gates, mate. I mean, that was that was really special in terms of their, their ability to be creative at that point in their career. And I, I think out of the three of those death metal records, the nightmare of being is, is by, was by far the most like, the wide, with the widest creative boundaries. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. It wasn't just a death metal album. It was like a bit of progressive um, death metal as well. It was a bit of prog. It was a bit of um, a bit of metal core at times. It was, it's just a superb, superb album. And and that's the thing. There might be, there might be lulls over a 20 to 25 year career. That's, that's kind of a given. But some of these, some of these, some of these bands that, that, that play, um, that play for like Carcass and At The Gates and, and some of the best musicians we've had in this genre. And they're the, they're the they're the grandfathers of the bands that we listen to now, and to deny them the opportunity to be able to come back and 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 work on and work on music would be to deny everyone of the opportunity to hear another great Carcass record, another great At the Gates record, another yeah. great Cannibal Corpse record, um, because there are there's a subsection of fans who love those bands um, that would take. I, I, I want one more great Cannibal Corpse song. I want one more great At the Gate song, and it's worth it for anything else. But luckily, these are so talented that they're, they're getting great albums as part of comebacks as well, and it's it's just so refreshing to see. Yeah, I mean, literally, I, I will accept that is a poor take from from those three records that I, I will take. Now that is a that is a poor take from me, and I will I will accept that, and I will admit that I was wrong. Do you like that, Sam? You got me. I, I do. It's it's recording on camera. Everything. <laughs> this is. This, I've, I've had dreams about this exact moment. Actually, it's Brilliant. wonderful. More specifically, then, Torn Artery, Sam, is this harsh, intelligent, brutal sounding death metal album from one of the genre's greats. And I think that it. it hey, this is this is their first album in eight years eight in years. Surgical Steel. So I guess maybe this is to be expected. But I found it truly like remarkable how this band still sounds so amped and fresh at this point in their careers. This album didn't feel old whatsoever. I genuinely think you could convince me these guys were like 26. Yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? There's, there's a, yeah, there's an absolute energy and, and, and a ferocity to this. It comes out the gate, um, the opening of this, the the, the, the title track, just t- torn out. It's just relentless. There's this. There's the thing about... The, the thing about... Um, about carcass that I really, really love. That there's a there's a ferocity, there's a there's a furious thrash metalcore nature. But there is also a groove, and there is there is there's a, there's a there's a specific type of guitar tone that they have as well. That is just so particularly unique. Yeah. Um. To to, to this to this band that you can kind of pretty easily identify as you as you listen to it. Um. And they they're just they're just they're just blending all, all some of the best elements of of what a great death metal album can be. Um, on on this opening track because that that riff is fantastic. Yeah. The way that why the sort of chords slide in the opening parts of the riff, and the way that it it gravitates into this groovy section later on, and then there's um there's that breakdown where they pause just for the guitar lead, yeah. which gets gradually higher up the neck, and and the the, the sort of the guitar the guitar notes get sort of sort of reach this crescendo and stuff. Um, it's just like a reminder that yeah we're we're, we're we're terrific musicians. We're one of the greatest metal bands of all time, and and here's another example of that. Um. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's, there's, there's an energy and a ferocity that they kind of don't back away from at any point. Uh, side note, one of the more interestingly titled collection of songs I've ever seen in, 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 in my life. Um, <laughs> Flesh Ripping Sonic Torment Limited. Brilliant. And Kelly's Meat Emporium. 
Um, got to be up there in terms of metal song titles, but from a musical from a musical standpoint, like you get you get this the opening trio of Dance of Ixtab and Eleanor Rigor Mortis, which is a fantastic pun by the way. Um, it's got a combination of this. There's, there's incredible drums and real groove on that second track, Dance of Ixtab, which is thoroughly enjoyable. And then on Eleanor Rigor Mortis, it's got like a cannibal corpse kind of sliding, snaky, chromatic riff once over again. And it's just, like you say, like it's full of energy and real enthusiasm, but actual menace as, as well. Um, I, 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 I'm really impressed by this. I'm really impressed by this. And it doesn't really take the foot off the gas at all. Um there's moments of progression here. There's moments of, of progressiveness later on in the album where they slow it down a bit and take a little bit of a step back. But in terms of the intensity, in terms of the um, some of the riff work and some of the individual musicianship here, I think this is just superb. Really, really good. Now, we I mentioned that this wasn't like, like it wasn't like a nightmare. This wasn't like a nightmare of being in terms of the creative boundaries haven't been stretched as far as that. No, but. Mate, there's a 10 minute song on this album. Dance of Ixtab has got a hint of like Gajira and it's kind of tribal opening. So this album isn't like an absolute straight by the books death metal album. I mean, mate, flesh ripping Sonic Torment, that kind of flamenco acoustic opening that blends into this kind of coarse, yeah, harsh riff. Agreed. Mate, 10 minute stretch tracks are not something that you would usually associate with being in Carcass's repertoire. But no, 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 there absolutely isn't. Within the confines of Flesh Ripping Sonic Torment Limited, which, is, like you say, is an amazing song title, there is a shopping list of highlights. There's around the two and a half minute mark, there's this really kind of doom riff that comes in with this kind of real grit and steel that you, you, it's impossible to not headbang along. After the second chorus, the song changes. It becomes almost a different song, and it takes on this more urgent, hyper-aggressive style momentarily. Then it drops into a more somber-led kind of feel. It's a real technical marvel of songwriting and crafting. That song, it really, really blew me away. I loved... <laughs> you talk about its song names. I loved the Scythe's remorseless swing. <laughs> because the opening instrumental is absolutely wicked and then there's this um there's this vocal line that um that jeff walker delivers what's he say you have all the time in the world but the world not does not belong to you and he delivers it with this classic like really dirty violent rasp that he's got and although death metal is genuinely like littered with these kind of vocalists that do these kind of low rasps jeff walker's is really really recognizable like yeah. even though i i don't ever heard heart work i I would have known this was Carcass from the second Tornado is burst into the speaker because he's, Jeff Walker's got this really kind of unique grit to his rasp. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. I absolutely do. There's a, there's, a, there's a type of cadence to his voice and the way that the words sort of tumble out that, that's really sort of identifiable. Um, it's 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 part and parcel of who they are. And I think it's the same for some of the guitar work here, that there's some recognisable Carcass traits in the way that they uh, the way that they play, some of the notes, some of the note signatures that they use, and some of the way that the riffs um, sort of just purely sound coming out of the speaker, the groove that they have um, is 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 incredibly identifiable and a and, and sort of a, something you could Im immediately attach to Carcass. Like if you listen um, to which one, Devil Rides Out, I think some gorgeous guitar work on the Devil Rides yeah. Out. Just at the, just at the start, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, these sort of leads and harmonies sort of cascading into each other. And then there's this final um, sort of signature at the end where it sounds kind of Eastern or Egyptian, where he's kind of playing those final little notes over the end as it's fading out. So I just I just love stuff like that to show that they're not just going to stick to the, the, the traditional sort of metal blueprint of what they could just do. They could just do 10 or 12 songs that sounded like Torn Artists, to be honest, if they wanted to. Um, but there's a real... There's a real change, there's a real transgression, there's a real um, combination of sounds that they can sort of experiment with. And, and that is part and parcel of the carcass sound that is as easy to identify as, as the vocals that you mentioned earlier. i tell you what I loved on The Devil Rides Out, and it was something that happened on the Ophidian Eye record fairly often. Some of the guitar work, like the clean guitar work, was acting as the chorus. Yeah. I love that. It's such a sweet trick. And 
so not just such a sweet treat for a death metal band as well for like the clean guitar to act as like this sweet melodic hook again you don't see that too often and the the kind of the riff runs as a repetition throughout the whole track acting is like it's kind of backbone it works so well there's so there's so many cool things to pick apart on this album there's <laughs> on wake up and smell the carcass again what an amazing song title in the middle eight there's a moment I've gone back and listened to like three or four times when I first heard the track. I just kept rewinding it and listening back to it. In that middle act, there's like a huge drum fill that's like with these space stop start vocals, and then this really chunky, fat, hefty riff comes in and takes you back into the groove metal sound system. And then this bending solo turns up. It is absolutely amazing. Like that track is gonna that when people hear that, that is gonna blow their minds because it's. It's so cool and ingenious and strikes out of nowhere and in the middle of, well, actually towards the end, sorry, of this record that has been a death metal album that you would absolutely associate with Carcass with a few sprinklings of something different. This moment of just death metal mastery genius comes in out of nowhere that just reminds you of the relentless quality that Carcass have got. I think in terms of, like, records from for a band of Carcass's ilk, of the length they've been doing this, I don't think you could really realistically have asked for more than what Carcass give you here. Like I said, there's a 10 minute song on this. I don't, have Carcass ever done a 10 minute song? I don't know. Have they ever done a song longer than seven minutes? Like I said, I've only ever listened to Heart Work, so maybe someone in the comments can tell me differently. But there's a 10 minute song on this, and it's amazing, and it's in intelligent, and it's like two or three songs fused into one. Some of this is really, really awesome. Death Metal's the best, man. Completely agree. I actually think Carcass have given us more than we could have expected. I, I, Carcass have nothing to lose here. Mm. Um, they already wrote one of the great metal albums of all time. Right? Then disappeared. Then wrote one of the great comeback metal albums of all time. And then disappeared for eight years again. <laughs> that could be the career. Like this could, be, this could be terrible. And it doesn't take away that they wrote two of the, the great albums uh, in terms of a comeback and, and an, an initial sort of metal album um this could have been anything and and it'd have been fine it wouldn't have changed their legacy wouldn't have changed their career they could have slipped back into uh, whatever they were doing prior during that eight-year hiatus just sort of enjoying themselves um this is this is tremendous this is terrific um it's a reminder that when when great musicians come together great things can still happen regardless of the circumstances that surround themselves in and a carcass are an example of a legendary band that I've maintained that. If you're a big Carcass fan, I don't know how you don't just adore this album. Yeah, this is um, special it's, it's for got, Carcass fans. It, it's got it's got everything. It's got really everything. Um, I think Scalper Blade is terrific. The Devil's Rides <laughs> Out is terrific. I think Flesh Ripping so Sonic Torment Limited is fantastic. Um, I like I like the opening of God We Trust in the harmony section near the end. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And that's the thing. Um, they they easily slide between. Um, really heavy thrashy segments and these beautifully melodic but also with like a dark chilling undertone to some of their some of their work as well that is is really identifiable some of the best melodic death metal i mean a death are the, are the band that i always think of that are brilliant at doing that particular thing and carcass are another example of that um I just think I just think they're tremendous. It's it's fantastic to have them back, and I think this album is a reminder of their quality. And again, it's another album that's going to get consideration for album of the year. It's 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 in my top twenty at the, at the very least. I haven't figured out the order, but it's definitely in that that chunk of of albums this year. Just to be close off here, Sam, would you take this over the Nightmare of Being? Ooh. Um, no, but only because I personally prefer At the Gates. Yeah, so on the same I, th I, 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 th I think that these albums for for a Carcass fan, this is as good as that Nightmare of Bean is for at the Gates fan. But I personally prefer at the Gates the fan to Carcass, so that's where my edge lies. But they're just as good as each other for what they do for their fans. I one hundred percent agree with that. One hundred percent agree. Uh, we're going to move on, Sam. Uh, we are going to talk about Mania Cult by Aborted. Uh, it is out on September 10th via Century Media Records. It's the band's 11th album and the follow-up to 2018's Terrorvision. Okay, so me and you and, and listeners, you're going to get really, especially when we start to talk about Turnstile, you're going to get really sick of us saying the word groove as on this episode because Carcass's album is full of grooves. 
Turnstile album, believe it or not, is full of grooves. And somehow, in this <laughs> absolute fire blast of de- death grind core, Aborted Mania Cult is also full of grooves. This is a different form of death metal than what we've just been talking about, Sam, because Carcasses is much, I feel, Torn Arteries is much more poised as opposed to Mania Cult, which is, I feel like I have been lined up in front of a turret and they have loaded the turret full of the harshest, blasting, brutal death metal they can possibly find. And they, and that has been this album and they have unleashed hell on me. This is just chaos, isn't it? This record, this is chaos. Yeah, it's 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 heaviness defined, isn't it? As 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 is typical. This is in that um, in that Azaya category where you're just sitting there thinking, "There's there's no way that the drummer's feet haven't fallen off. There's yeah. no way." Um, and there's moments where you're thinking to yourself, um, "Is that a vocalist or is that Satan?" Yeah. Um, I, I'm yet to, I'm yet to figure out the answer to that one. Are there two vocalists, and are they both killing animals simultaneously whilst in the studio? At this point, is this technically a hate crime? These are all these are all questions that I've asked myself at some point during this album. Um, this is for a certain subsection of metal fans. Is it oh yeah, good? yeah. Um, and uh, for spoiler alert. If you you thought to yourself, oh, that Carcass album sounds pretty good, but it's a bit too heavy for me, so I might be all white for the Turnstile review on the podcast, then keep skipping now that we're aborted. Yeah. Um, because there is nothing here for you, my friends. Um, I'll be honest. Um, I like this, but this is nothing I haven't heard before. Oh, yeah, this isn't breaking any kind of new boundaries. This isn't scratching so, any new surfaces. This, is, this isn't drawing in any new colours. I will be honest. Um... I was a bit more enthusiastic than you were about, I think it was Sleep Waker, and you said, am I so um, jaded by metalcore? Yeah, yeah. I feel that way. I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but have we heard too many death metal grindcore concept albums about HP Lovecraft inspired Apocalyptica? Because I actually think <laughs> we have. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary that that's, that's a niche that's been done more than once or more than 12 times in the last two years. Uh, like someone's read War of the Worlds, I get it, cool. Um, but so I, I, I want to say that this is everything that you would want from this type of music, with a little bit of like black metal progression. There's some, there's some nice moments at the start, and then where there's like sinister leads, like there's, there's a bit of the opening, and I think um, I want to pronounce this right, Epedidrilletti at the at the conclusion of the at the conclusion of the album has like a wonderfully progressive intro that then they go into the, their usual grind. But eighty yeah. percent the meat and bones of this is just chugging grindcore with pig squeals over it. If you're into that, you'd love it. If you're not a fan of that, give it a miss. For me, I've heard a lot of this over the last two years, and I don't think it steps beyond the boundaries or in the ramifications of whatever. I couldn't, I couldn't understand simultaneously why this is their 11th album, because they do this very well. But also, I couldn't understand why it's their 11th album when we're reviewing it for the first time, because they're not pushing beyond their genre at all either. They're just happily within their audience within their niche writing you know, sort of concept albums about the apocalypse and the end of the world and social decay and all that sort of stuff and they're delivering it with a typical punch and darkness and fury so like for example i think like the best part about it for me my one of my, my highlights was the riff at the opening of dementophobia um there's there's a there's a moment there's there's a real there's obviously as you talk about groove that there, there is a real real groove to that is, and then yeah. they, they, cha- they change up the transitions and it's both half time and then a speed up um they like every great metal band now every great modern metal band of this extremity the transitions from slow half time to blast beats throughout this album are just extraordinary um and some of the some of the vocals are utterly utterly guttural but my criticism is that there's a lot of this that does blend together a little bit um, there's a lot of it where the songs are, 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 are sort of difficult to discern from one another because they, they do follow a similar sort of blueprint throughout. Like, for example, when you get to the two thirds section, um, the songs like Volga Quagmire and Verbalgen, um, 
they could be either way around for me, and 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 they could be they could be as similar to each other as as as, as necessary because I think they just are. Um, when it comes back with ceremonial ineptitude and drag me to hell, that's when it starts to change. I think that conclusion, those final two or three songs of ceremonial ineptitude, drag me to hell, and 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 good tri- good test to be fair is great as well. That final trio leading up to um, the concluding song, Ipedruletti, um, is terrific. Yeah. Um, but I think the main meats and bones of the, uh, the, the the album is very good, particularly for a particular audience. I just think for me, it's a touch repetitive and I have been down this road several times in the last few months. I am with you to a certain extent. I mean, I, I think this album is specifically made as kind of like cannon fodder for aborted fan base. I feel like this album is specifically made for a fan base to have a real deep rooted love and obsession with give me the heaviest thing you've got all the time. <laughs> I, I genuinely believe that. I, I believe that this record was specifically made with with no other intention in mind but to give as heavy and as hard and as quick as they possibly can because that's what their fan base craves and is obsessed with. I'm with you, man. I The, the final four songs on this album for me are the best. The way that Verbolgan transitions into Ceremonial Aptitude is the coolest thing on the album. Because that, that opening riff hits like a truck after the instrumental tease. And there's a really brilliant moment where it breaks into a kind of like a half-time riff near the end. And it's really well done. Groovy as all hell. Like I said, we're going to use that word, unfortunately, a lot on this podcast. But we are talking about three <laughs> albums that do groove. Uh, and inta- as, insane, all insane, and mate, as all hell. As all hell. In terms of Drag Me To Hell... I felt like the moment where Svencho, the vocalist, does the drag me to hell scream and it goes into the blast beat sound. Classic Die Art is murder. Yeah. And that's not to say that obviously Abortive have been around a lot longer than Die Art, so that's not like me saying they've looked at Die Art is murder and taken that away. It's that that's where I draw these comparisons. And one thing I would say about Mania Cult as a record, it's ne- I don't ever think it's specifically death metal. I feel like it fluctuates between death core, death grind, and death metal, which is actually kind of cool because on Portal to Vacuity, you get this kind of spiraling, chaotic sound, which is like reminiscent of humanity's last breath. But then when the pace changes in the verse, you get hit with this kind of Asaya or All Shall Perish sound. And one thing that really caught me off guard is that the opening track, Verdurf. That slow, full chord sound is very humanity's last breath. It's yeah. got this kind yeah. of like slow tempo, aggressive start to the record. And I thought, right, okay, this is going to be like a, a high pinched, like kind of Viljata or Humanity's Last Breath attempt. But then when the title track comes in, <laughs> the Durf must have been a red herring because it charges out with this kind of throat tearing speed. And this uh, that's what this album does. It is a, like a constant, constant like throat punch, throat tear, whatever kind of adjective, whatever kind of metaphor you want to go for. In terms of violence, this album is that. It's it's not gonna. It's one of those. It's one of those records that like Metal Twitter on the tenth of September is gonna kick off for this album. The metal tw- the metal Twitter that I follow, they're all gonna go mad for it because they all see they you know I love this. It's a bit like when I was listening to the new Cerebral Rock record. It's just horrible. It's horrible for forty five minutes, and there's there's really. <laughs> There's not a lot of fluctuation in terms of what you are being delivered. You are being delivered a constant, like I say, just turret barrage of really brutal death metal. But it it, it hits so hard. And it's it's fun to listen to. This isn't going to break any boundaries, but it's going to do exactly what Aborted's audience wants it to do, want it to do for them. And I re really, I I really enjoyed listening to this. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a fun ride. Uh, mate, mate, no, mate, no bones about it. And like I said, if you are, I mean, if you if you live in the world that me and you live in, which is Heidi's underworld for for metal bands, um, then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna thoroughly enjoy this. My only criticism is really that, like you talk about, people are gonna kick off on the tenth of September. Will they be kicking off on the twenty eighth of September? No, no. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it, it, you. And this is the thing. This is why I said that. This is why it's their eleventh album, but they're not headlining Bloodstock. Um, it's be- and there's no criticism to that. I'm just saying that it's good, and it. But 
I reckon the second aborted album was as good as this one and probably as good as the sixth and the seventh. And I haven't heard the the previous 10 aborted songs. I reckon if I did back to back, I think I'd be a, a murderer by the end, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I'm trying to say it's, it's fantastic for its audience. It's fantastic for its niche. It's fantastic for the genre. It ticks every conceivable box that you'd want in your Lovecraftian apocalyptic death grind, uh, death core albums. Um, it does it does everything you'd possibly want from that and a few and a few other bits as well. Um, it doesn't doesn't go beyond its ramifications or its limits or its limits, but it is fantastic in that particular in that particular genre. Um, like I said, like we said, if you're an extreme metal fan, you're gonna be all over this, absolutely all over this. Before your interview with Tommy Rogers of Between the Buried and Me comes in, Sam, let us talk about. Oh my God, so excited! Turnstile's new album, Glow On. It's out now on Road Runner Records. It came out on August 27th. It is the do you band's... even need me here for this? Oh, or my God. Do you just do a monologue and I can make a cup of tea or something? I might, I might do a monologue, mate. It might be a long, long time for you here. Um, <laughs> it's the band's fourth album and the follow-up to 2018's Time and Space. Oh, my God, that album's so amazing. Well, right, okay. So, even before this album, I... I have been picking Turnstiles, one of the most exciting bands permeating alternative music for a while now. And I say that I'm not looking for any credit whatsoever saying that. I'm not saying that so people can think, you know what, Chris does know what he's talking about. You don't need to know what you're talking about in of alternative music to look at Turnstiles and say, yeah, they're going to be one of the bands. They are, just without doubt. And the reason why I say that, Sam, is because I, I listened to Time and Space before... 2000 trees and i was like wow this album is like amazing this band are incredible and then i saw them at 2000 trees and i was literally blown away as was myself and the two lads i was with uh, andy and rich we all three of us were like this is special man like the, char the charisma that they all have on stage these riffs that brody ever the lead guitarist is throwing at us i just i cannot believe them the energy they give off in general, this truly just gobsmacking fun that Turnstile just emit from every single pore of their body. We saw them in Birmingham, Sam, and even I mean that was our last gig that we that we went to before the chaos of COVID nineteen ensued, and that was when you were like kind of lukewarm on them. But yeah. I, we had, you know, we all left that gig with the same feeling. You were like, you know what? I'm still not massive on, but that was so much fun. I really, really enjoyed watching that. Sam, I don't want to just treat this as a complete monologue. I, I, you know, I want to have like this back and forth with you. How you knew leaving that gig that whether you became a full, fully in love with Turnstile, whether you'd be a full backer of them, or whether you'd constantly stay in the middle, regardless of that, you knew leaving that gig, that band are fun to watch live. And in 2021, that's a real, real important thing, being fun to watch live because... We've said a million times, record sales across the globe are down and artists need live ticket sales to be up to make a living out of this. So being fun live has never been more important. How much fun are Turnstile to watch? Oh, they're terrific. They're terrific. There's a, there's a, there's a fantastic energy with that band. And like you said, you talk about the charisma. Um, and it helps that the music is really, um, really immediately compelling. It's not difficult to get into. Um there's 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 a real there's a there's a dance there's a beat there's a there's there's something you can latch yourself onto, um, and that is that is mimicked by the live performance. It's just a, there's just an energy and a, and a and a primal primal feeling that sort of accompanies them playing live. Yeah, when Time and Space came out, I was all right with it. Um, I was I was ambivalent towards it, and and then everyone not naming any names kept telling me that they're saying like Pantera, and I just didn't buy that at all because. Um, that's the, the, now that's hold it, on, it. wait, that's wait a second there. To I, me like, I on. never said they sound like Pantera. I said if Pantera were a hardcore <laughs> I didn't punk say band, you, Chris. No, you, you were talking about me. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't be. Don't, I don't want no ambiguity here. You point the finger at me, right? 
I never said they sound like Pantera. I said if Pantera were a hardcore punk band, they'd sound like this. And obviously, I know that's if you aren't with your uncle kind of thing. But yeah, if they were a jazz band, that sound like Miles Davis. That, sure that was well. that was my thing. Like if Pantera were a hardcore punk band, they'd sound like this because Brady drops out riffs like on Phased Out and like on Generator, which have got that really southern grit. And they're not as bluesy as Dimebag's riffs. They're not as bluesy. But like I said, Pantera were in a world of their own in terms of their groove metal sound. No one will ever touch them. But what my my what my point was, if Pantera decided to be a hardcore punk band, they'd sound like this. Okay. So before it's okay. before anyone thinks that I think that turns out sound like Pantera, no, they don't. If Pantera hardcore punk band, they would sound like time and space. Sam, I'm sorry to predict where you're going here, but if you're going in the direction of Turnstile have never sounded less like what Pantera would be if they were hardcore punk, I do agree with that. Because this is this is the least time and space like that Turnstile have ever sounded. Yeah, there's a progression from the, the previous album to now, absolutely. I now think that they're the scrappy do to every time I die, Scooby Doo. Um, where they're like the sort of energetic little brother of, of that that type of, of that type of, of that type of band. And um in terms of in terms of their groove and their, their energy and the, the way the riff sound, they're a party band. Yeah. Turn turnstile are. They're the archetypal five o'clock on a Friday night at download band. And they're also the ultimate put on the speaker and just try and gravitate to anybody that likes rock music and beyond type album this fits in anywhere i could show anybody this um and they have they have really taken a step towards it, it, it step in that direction where it is more accessible and more immediately affecting than in their previous works um the the tran the transition and growth that they've made from just an exciting band with some occasional good riffs that are really sort of tying the rest of it together to, to what they are now i think there's a there's a there's a real growth that's taken place here because this chris is a victory the amazing of the height of the, of the highest order of, yeah. of a band of this of this style um because um i was i was i was listening to this i i, I was this a few times over, over the last couple of days because it's such an enjoyable album to listen to and it's yeah. it's it's an album that requires no stress whatsoever no you could just chuck this on and barely pay attention, but just enjoy every second of it. You can fit yourself in and out. It, it's just such a, it can accompany any activity. Um, but at the, at the same time, I find this quite extraordinary about it is that there's a lot of riffs in this album, a lot of styles here that I have heard in snippets from a variety of different bands and a variety of different genres. Uh, I mentioned every time I die, there's a bit of every time I die here. There's a bit of Weezer I heard here at times. Um, with like a pop punk styling, but also sort of more hardcore and more classic rock sections elsewhere. Um, there's also like, you know, up, up tempo punk here. Like there's a bit of like rancid going on, just doing some some of the, some of the thrash type, a bit of misfits, things like that going on permeating through. But the concoction of all of those elements together is something that I've not quite heard, and. This is um this is simultaneously a exciting note for where the where this band could be in the future, but also just a thoroughly enjoyable throwback to what feels like a simpler time. Like I don't know how else to explain it. I've never I've never really listened to an album that makes me feel simultaneously excited for the future and nostalgic for the past, or want to be. Se I want to listen to this album be seventeen with a skateboard. I don't know. It, it it it's really really it's really strange how this album makes you genuinely feel youthful. Um. There's a there's a there's a bite to it, but also there's just so much exuberance and enthusiasm permeating from this from this album from start to finish. It's just bursting out the gate um, with just riff and riff and riff and moment after moment after moment. It doesn't stay its welcome. It but it piles Ramon style. There's 14, 15 tracks into this 37 minute segment. Like you can listen to this in one shopping trip you could go to the gym or have one session and get through this album probably twice mm. you know you could go for one run and listen to this album it's not a problem at all it's just beautifully condensed into this one i've watched episodes of the sopranos that are longer than this album it's just absolutely extraordinary um because when it, it just opens um just it I wrote this. I wrote this about it, and and, and and like I said, I'm ambivalent about this band before this album. So that that should that should say a lot, I think, to, to begin with, just in terms of what they're what they're saying. This is what I wrote as I listened to the album. I think twice, 
uh, Turnstile party, um, part way, party rock band, post hardcore thrill, part pop punk sensibility, and hundred percent fantastic because that's that. It's just a different concoction of stuff, but the the, the cocktail of that is just utterly, utterly wonderful. Um, I'm going to throw it back to you. Now we can do like sort of individual songs and things, but really, this is just from pretty much from start to finish, just a tremendous, tremendous album. Well, I think that when you boil music down to its purest form and purely what you're looking for from listening to music is entertainment, isn't it? Really? Yes. Let, let's not let's not like pick about the specifics of metal, death metal, this riff's great, X, X, Y, Z. We listen to music to be entertained. I have not been entertained by an album, by another album as much this year as I, as I, I have not, sorry, the best way to phrase this, put this phrase, I haven't received the same level of entertainment from any other album this year as I have from Glow On. This album is so much fun to listen to. It's, yes. it, like you said, this album is a 34 foot or 37 minute party. But then when you do take a second to actually listen to what's going on, the vibrancy, the creativity, mate, the bravery of some of this, mate, Underwater Boy, <laughs> I, I, that out that song is really wet. I think it's like the fourth song on the album. You get this real kind of bold, bold creativity, creativity in that song. Like, in my knowledge of Turnstile, I've never heard them quite take that kind of synth pop direction. But no, to pull it off. And Brendan Yates, the vocalist, is so flexible with the styles he sounds comfortable in, and that's what's really awesome about this song and more specifically this album it's totally unique and individualistic like there's parts of this album that sound more like paramore than they do hardcore punk but still in this way that's totally linked to turnstile sound like underwater boy the song i'm talking about here there are moments where it sounds as i've mentioned it's more like paramore's last album than hardcore punk but i still know it's turnstile there's just something about them there's just this kind of unique party vibe that they drill through every bit of writing that is so unique and direct to them. I personally prefer Time and Space to this album because I, I'm a bit of a riff junkie for Turnstile. And that is not to say that this album is lacking in riffs. It absolutely is not. But I just prefer Time and Space's kind of 30-minute relentless hardcore punk thrashing. Whereas this is... It's much more, uh, much more open. Its wingspan it is, it goes to a, a much bigger radius. I am curious, Sam, what you think about songs like Alien Love Call. I'm not as I'm not as keen on them as as the, as the rest of the album. Like I have the most fun when it's dancey riffs as yeah. as, as as much as anything else but I appreciate them for what they do with the gravity of the album. Like, I, 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 love, I love Alien for what it does for Wild World. Yeah, yeah, that's good, because that, that's a good point, actually, because Alien Love Call does kind of blend sp- di- directly into Wild World, because Wild World comes back in with the, with the ruckus punk vibe, doesn't it? And that bit, Absol- the build-up from Alien Love Call leads to this huge payoff when the drummer comes back in behind Brady and Pat's riff. Preci- pre- precisely. So I, I love No Surprises, Fully Just For Lonely Desires. Yeah, that's good. In, in, in yeah. exactly the same way. So do I like them individually? For, I'm, I'm ambivalent towards them individually, but they're not meant to be listened to individually. Yeah. Like No Surprises is 70 seconds long. That's not a single. It's an intro. Um. So I've, I appreciate what they're doing for the context of the album. They're not necessarily enjoying them um, in a vacuum um, because they are the turnstile know what their strengths are they're just sort of experimenting out and coming back into them distract taking your way and pulling you back towards them uh, it's like a it's like a great it's like a great movie plot when the when the character goes away just to come back you know and that that's what it is it, it, because, because if you I probably recognize if it was 15 riff laden songs maybe the audience wouldn't get as, as excited about them when they do return if they go away for a bit yeah um so let's let's talk about some of these some of these fantastic moments, please. Um, Don't play is one of the greatest rock songs I've heard in the last five years. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, 
do that combina- combination of the... Remember you said last week you never heard a Latin clave beat in the Tursal do two on this <laughs> album? Um, just br- bringing that back with the up-tempo punk being that... Do, 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 do. It's just so, so good. And that just that just back beat underneath that sort of doom, doom, doom. I just, I'm, I'm such a, I'm such a fan of that beat. That's my favourite groove on the album. Um, but that opening trio of of mystery with that sort of Weezer start, um, sort of almost like post Dookie pre American idiot Green Day style sort of strumming, um, coming into into Blackout, which has got that just beautifully up tempo, um, up tempo riff with. An up tempo riff and beat with that that real with a real explanation of melody on, on mystery and blackouts. Then obviously you get don't play uh, with sort of the Latin sounds on the chorus and stuff. I, I just think it's absolutely tremendous. Um, and then obviously you get you get underwater boy and I feel like the band takes a breather, experiments the synth pop, and then comes right back into holiday, which is just a brilliant song, absolutely brilliant song. Immediately stomping central figure, enticing electronica, incredible bass line. I enjoy the punchy shouted lyrics that feels very late seventies uh, new wave punk for me, which I'm a fan of. Um, and then same the humanoid shake up the seam the seamless switch between those two. It clearly felt like they'd written one half of the song, another half of the song, and they'd sort of splice them together. Um, and then obviously we talk about um Alien and Alien going to Wild World, um, New Heart Design going to TLC, no surprise into Lone Desires. This is a really, really well layered and well put together, well pieced together album. It's just a jigsaw of tremendous riffs and and obviously as, as the, the the word of the day is groove isn't it and it just has that has that in abundance i have not enjoyed myself listening to an album as much as this this year what i think is quite telling here is that and it, this was like an interesting marketing ploy from turnstile a lot of this album we'd heard they released a lot of this album as an ep it was called turnstile love connection I say a lot of this album. I think it was like four songs, and then and then they did Blackout as a single as well. So we'd gone in here, listen or already hearing a fair portion of this. But yeah, when you listen to it all them. within the context of the record, like I'd heard Mystery a million times. I, I love that song, but when you hear this opening the album, what a way to open a record, Mystery is. Yeah. That kind, the kind of space synth that drops into the sick riff, and it just immediately, I'm listening to it, it's got a massive like shit eating grin on my face. Like just listening to it because it's so much fun. You've got this perfect summertime smile vibe. Like how can you not get caught onto that? And we talk about a blackout. The way that mystery transitions into it is kind of like harsh, but also smooth at the same time. Like uh, it's like it's perfectly set up to be jarring, but that jar works. What can you say about Blackout? There's so much life to it. And me and you talk about this quite often. The riffs you can sing to are the best. And this album is absolutely full of them. The chorus on Blackout, that kind of effect pedal that Brady uses on the the chorus, mate, it's it's so brilliant. Like, just hearing, as you're hearing Blackout live, like, would we dance or would we push? I don't know what we would do. Like, it's, and that's, oh, it's so good. I my favourite song on the album is New Heart Design. I okay. think the bounce and the melody to that song is just gorgeous. The playful synths to Brendan's chorus hook, you know, it's one of the best songs they the turnstile I've ever written. I think it's really, really stunning. I would like to make a mention for um Franz Lyons, who doesn't get mentioned anywhere nearly enough for Turnstile. He's an amazing bassist. And also as well as that. His backup vocals add so much character. If there was even more so to be added in, he's a real, real vital cog in the weird of Turnstile, especially live because of me. We mentioned it some when we saw him in Birmingham, and not we said when I saw him at Two Thousand Trees. How much fun is the bassist having? He bounces yeah. around that stage with a massive smile on his face, loving every single second, and it's infectious. You can't help but just get caught along to it on endless. There's a clean riff that flickers into the verse, and it's just genius. Uh, Brendan, again, I'll mention Brendan Yates, sounds incredible on this track. I, I think Endless is probably his best of a vocal performance. You know, it's it's party punk as infectious and as sweet grinned as you'll have ever heard it. Yeah, it's, and, it's, intox- it's intoxicated, isn't it? Yeah, intoxicating is a great adjective to describe this record. 
I, I just don't know how anyone could listen to this and not have an amazingly, amazingly good time. This record is, is it's partly hardcore punk. It's, is it hardcore punk? I think it's, it's, a, it's it ambiguous, isn't it? It has moments of it, it has moments of it, but I don't think it's generally a hardcore punk album. No. I, 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 I would, I would say this is a rock album with yeah. elements of hardcore punk with elements of hardcore with elements of pop punk at times with elements of, of synth wave but really it's under the it's under the great umbrella of of rock and how nice is it by the way i think if if, if we accept my theory just to be able to say this is a great rock album where the fuck have they been yeah. great yeah, rock yeah. albums we've had the dirty <laughs> nil and this that is that, it that is that is the that is the list um and just just to have 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 that sort of vibe and groove back because this is something this is something I could show my dad. Yeah, I was gonna mention that. I was gonna mention that, yeah. Because I think I think he listens to I think if my dad hears Turnstile at 18 in nineteen seventy nine, they're his favourite band when he's yeah. like forty. Yeah. Um because that's just you, you hear you hear him in that in that moment. Um, and that's what I think they, they feel simultaneously like a throwback and also incredibly sort of modern and fun at the same time. Um, I think it's interesting touching on something that you said. You prefer Time and Space because it's a riff junkie and yet your favourite song on the album is it's one of its more progressive ones. Yeah, yeah. But I... I, I feel like Brady... Brady's my favourite member of the band. Yeah, what Gibson Explorer playing these riffs, mate? Do you not love it? He's my favorite member of the band, and I, I think he's on his best form on Time and Space. I, that's fair my enough. that's that, fine. that that's, that's fine. how that's I that's enough. how I justify that. But no, that's that, completely understandable. I, I I see that makes sense. Like that's a criticism for this album. Is no. it's absolutely not a criticism. I think this album is brilliant, and. One of the one of the the best thing we can say about this album is that you love it, and it, I find that fascinating because if anyone here was going to be the riff junkie, you would think it would be you over me because it's usually you know usually we talk about an album and I'm the one that gets hooked into the clean chorus and you're like yeah but that riff that comes after, whereas there's a little bit of a role reversal here which is kind of interesting, but this album. I genuinely believe you could show this to anyone. Yeah, I agree. Anyone. I could play this in the background to my mom, and she would get something yeah. out of it. In, yeah, I agree. And no one could listen to this album and not have fun. This is party hardcore punk. Who doesn't love that? Turnstile are, are amazing. Like, I if if you'd have asked me where I thought they were going to go after time and space, I wouldn't have picked this. Not because I wouldn't have wanted them to do this, just because I thought they would probably do Time and Space Part Two. They've done. Yeah. They they haven't done Time and Space Part Two. They've introduced a new. They've introduced a new book, and something tells me, Sam, that whatever follows this in maybe twenty twenty four will be another new book. Because that's yeah, Where where are their boundaries? I don't think they no, exist. I, I think that's. I think that's really really good. Uh, I completely agree. I think this is the album that they needed to write, where they actually took a, an expansive step beyond Time and Space Two, because me and you not, uh, and, and even if we'd have been in Time and Space Two, we'd have been like, cool. Well, what else? Even yeah, you yeah. would have felt like that. Yeah, yeah. And at, at, at least, at least, at least this way, you're like, all right, okay. Because there's there's guitar solos, there's real choral melodies, there's experiment with electronica. Not a great deal, but enough to hint that there's going to be like a synthwave led album at some point you can see that that's 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 coming there's going to be a new order style um album in the near future and it might be the next one um but they're also having it rooted into this punk punk and rock riff sensibility and and that's it i just it's lovely to have riffs riffs that are enjoyable in in like a non grueling way as well um, me, me and you, me and you talk about great riffs. Really, it's it's the violence unimagined of, of the breakdown, or or yeah, yeah. or something like that, where the actual notes themselves are kind of indiscernible, indiscernible, indecipherable, and, and kind of superfluous to the overall point. Is it just have heavy and nasty? Uh, is usually sort of the minimum requirement to sort of get into that. But this is genuine riff work of like like some classic rock bands. 
that 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 would be mixed with just this um, um real like uh, melody and immediate sort of um engaging a sort of approach to songwriting as well uh you might you might screw your nose with this but this kind of reminds me of offspring like early offspring right, yeah no i get you that. know like in terms of like like when they when they were like good like for that six months um but when that when they wrote riffs that were chord based that you could sing along to or like when green day wrote chord based riffs that you could sing along to that were easily identifiable this is a this is a this is a hard rock album that's also a dance floor filler that has real bounce to it as well and charisma like you mentioned um this is certainly i don't think i'm gonna have more fun listening to an album um at all this year it's um it's just a tremendous thrill ride i saw on twitter that b's called it his album of the year as well um and it's hard it's hard not to argue um, with putting it in a top three five seven ten um however wherever you want to limit it it's definitely going to be in in my list at some point yeah this this absolutely enters my top 10 at the minute as i'm kind of mentally piecing it together i think my top 10 is gonna get kind of chucked thrown spat out and twisted around over the next eight weeks or so with the release schedule that we are looking at but you know what i said that i prefer time and space but if you would have asked me what i wanted turnstile to do the best i could have hoped for is this because i would have wanted them to do something bold and brave whatever that might be for them and they've done that and I would have wanted them to master that as well. And yes. I think that I think they've absolutely done that. They sound like a mix of early nineties Green Day, twenty nineteen Paramore, eighties Clash. Do you know what I mean? There's this absolute plethora of interesting melody, of teeth teeth gnashing guitar tone and of more than anything else just this concoction of hook there is so much to this album that you can just nod along smile at and sing along to it is man it's just a non-stop thrill ride this record it's a real real astonishing achievement i think that i, I love that you love it i'm just going to leave off with this actually are you surprised that you of, of how much you like it? Let's let's rewind and say it's it's June twenty seventh. I can't remember when it was announced that the album was going to come out. Let's pretend it was June twenty seventh that it was announced. We're going back two months. In June twenty seventh, do you reckon your fears of Turnstile then would make you surprised at how much you love it listening to it now? Yeah, but I, I'd, I'd be like, okay, another review where people's like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to music. I'm like, it's all right, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's, what I was, that's what I was thinking it would be. Um, but the good thing is, is that I heard the four singles. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, were, they were popping up on my Spotify and I was giving them a go and the first one was good. So the second one I gave a go. And then and then I, by, by the third and fourth, I was excited that that appeared. Um, so actually that, that process where you'd heard a third of the album going in, actually softened me because I went in expecting to enjoy the rest of it, not bracing myself yeah. um, at the possibility of having to feel uh, differently to the, to the zeitgeist. And then, um, and then of course, as I was listening to it, enjoying it, it was actually, um, it was nice to see the, um, the timeline sort of swell on Twitter of, of just joy over the last sort of three or four days as been of the, of this turnstile album. It seems to have, it seems to have struck a chord with the, with the metal community and the rock community as well. Because really, at our hearts, we just love we love great music. Yeah. Um. It doesn't need to be, you know, centered around a graveyard all the time. Um. And there are there are some things that are just universal. And I think Turnstile have, have, have hit on something that is universal: is that people just want to enjoy themselves. People want to dance. People want stuff that they can nod their head to and enjoy. Because I, you are absolutely right. Um. Music at the bottom line is meant to be entertaining. It is meant to be fun. Um. And by that, by that judgment, by that requirement, there are a few albums that do that better or more often than Turnstile have on this latest release. They're a special band, aren't they? It feels that way. Yeah, it feels that way. 
They're a special band. Glow On is a special record. We are going to leave the podcast off of there before Sam's interview with Tommy Rogers comes in. However, we are going to be back. Let me just double check the date that we are going to be back. I believe it's going to be the 14th of September. Uh, let's have a look here. Yes, it is. Uh, me and Sam are going to be back on the 14th of September. Listen to this for a podcast lineup. It's going to be my review of Slam Dunk, Iron Maiden Senjutsu, Employed to Serve's new record, Rivers of Nile's new record, and Sleep Talker's new record. How about that for a podcast for you? That is going to be in two weeks. For the end of this episode, it is Sam's interview with Tommy Rogers from Between the Buried and Me. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to follow us on podcast uh, on Twitter at Noise Podcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube or like and follow, depending on whatever service you are using. That's the best way to support us. We're going to be back in two weeks' time, but don't go anywhere. Sam's interview with Tommy Rogers comes up right now. We'll see you in two weeks. We love you. Bye. All right, marvellous. So we've got Tommy from Between the Buried and Me. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, thanks so much for coming over and speaking to us about the new record. I want to just dive right in and talk about the new record, Colours 2. Um, so obviously it's a landmark album that came out in 2007 for you guys. What was the process that led to the decision to write a sequel to such a landmark album? What was that, what was that like and, and why did you decide to do that now? Um, well, it was in 2019. We were actually on the road and our, our drummer, Blake, just kind of put us to the side and was like, hey, I have this idea for the next record, you know, see if you guys are into it. You know, and he, we talked about it and it was one of those things where we thought the idea could be cool, but we only wanted to do it if we knew that it was something we could pull off 100%, you know. So it was kind of always in the back of our head. And then when we when we started writing it and getting heavily into the material, we, it was very early on that we're like, all right, this is going to really work. It's um, things are lining up the way they should. And it just, you know, it's, it's hard to explain. Sometimes things just like feel really right when you're working on music. And it was just one of those moments where we knew it was the right thing to do. And it just, it was very cohesive. And it was just a, a aside from the weird 2020 year, it was a very good experience uh, creatively. Yeah, so speaking of, speaking of that specifically, you mentioned, I, I was reading through some of the notes that the, the PR sent us with the album, and I said that yeah. um, you were able to analyse humanity in the same way that you were in 2007. Right, okay, so there were some sort of similarities in terms of the way that you sort of approached it um, from that mindset. So in that regard, was it a circumstantial decision to, to do Colours 2? Is there a parallel universe where were you not able to look at humanity in the same way with the pandemic and things like that? Would you be looking at a different between the buried and me album at this moment? Is it is it that sort of thing that that had happened for you guys, or was it just simply I this is the right time to do this regardless of the circumstances going on around us? Well, I th- I don't, it's hard to I don't think the record would have been what it is without the pandemic. Honestly, I mean we talked about doing it regardless, and we probably would have done it regardless. Um, but I think the the pandemic just really helped helped it, everything like I think conceptually it like brought it all together it kind of put us in a place where you know we wanted to get back in that mentality we were in when writing colors one which was you know go for it like just give it all you have because we have to really prove that we're worthy to still be around and to still you know have the fan base we have and you know and and show the world that you know we're still a big force to reckon with you know and and so like with with 2020 happening we just were put in this position that it really opened our eyes like we really have to put in the work i mean we always put in the work but it was just like way more than normal and i think creatively things just exploded for us i mean it was um, it, it was definitely the most collaborative we've ever been we worked really well together even though it was kind of a weird circumstance without um being in a room ever to so we got in the studio. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just everything aligned properly. And, and we really, I think it was therapeutic in a way as, as well. And like you were saying, lyrically, um, you know, the, the whole idea of, of doing a Colors 2, I wanted to kind of approach lyrics like I did back then, which is not a, not a, a big story like I've been doing the last few records. And that was something that excited me. And I wanted to do anyway, because I was kind of, not getting bored with the whole huge story thing the concept album thing I just I was kind of feeling like I was in a corner and and I was 
I was supposed to be doing it rather than wanting to do it. Right, I see. So when we decided to do Colors 2, I was like, oh, I'm going to treat it like, you know, like I did back then, just go out and write, not have a huge purpose. And and because of the year, it, it was almost like journal entries for me. You know, I would just go out when, when, when you know, ideas sparked something and I, I would go out in the woods, you know, as, as much as I could and just sit down and, and write. And um, I think because of that, you know, I, I created some some lyrical themes and um, just moods in general that I think a lot of people will relate to just because of the year I was in. And I think I was feeling probably certain things that everybody was feeling. And, you know, it was it was the first time in a long time I kind of got to like let off some steam through lyrics rather than just like diving into a story I'm making up. So that it was uh, therapeutic in that sense. So I know that was all over the place, but yeah, I mean, I, I think <laughs> over, overall, like the pandemic with all its negatives, I think it really helped the album in a way. Yeah. I've got a few, I've got a few follow-ups. That was something really, really interesting. You said that you mentioned how um, this is the most, most collaborative process you've ever really had in terms of writing an album. Yeah. Um, and yet you were never in the same room at all. So mm. um, I listened to this, I listened to this new album. We reviewed it on, on the podcast. We loved it. Um, and mm-hmm. I was I was astonished at some of the transitions that you seem to seamlessly go from one genre to another, um, yeah. almost almost on a dime. Now, I my, my natural assumption uh, was surely they would have sat in a room and figured that out. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you, you, you play along with each other and you say, oh, you're going to do that bit there and we're going to do that drum roll yeah. here that leads to this. But without no, you in us. the room at all, <laughs> how does the transitions go? Does the does your drummer come in and say, oh, I've got this Latin part that I want to include and then the, the guitar, um, the guitar's going to say, how does that work exactly? I mean, it changes a lot. I mean, it really depends on the song and the part. Um, but I mean, we've been we've been working like that for quite a while. I mean, we 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 normally get up maybe two or three times before we record to kind of just go over some ideas that we've been working on. But for the most part, we always write remotely and kind of individually, and and it's something that's really worked for us for a while now. And I think just because so much work and so much like small minute detail goes into like little things that you can only do when you're sitting by yourself and and working on it you know and and it and I think that's what you know when you have five guys working on different things um you know there's a lot of variety we all write very differently but I mean as far as transitions it's just I mean honestly it's just it's not something we really are super aware of how, how the process works. It just, we make it work, you know? I mean, people come in with, you know, a riff or people come in with a section or a, or a good chunk of a song, it, it, it changes a lot. And, you know, we all, I think one thing that people don't realize is that we're like a lot of times there's multiple things happening at once. Like maybe me and Dan will be working on one song and Paul and Blake will be working on something else. and yeah, I mean, and certain, you know, I think we all have strengths and weaknesses and some guys are are really good at making things flow. Uh, like you said, like genres work really well together and flow. And yeah, I mean, it's all just kind of, we, we go off how, how we're feeling and we're all very honest. Like, you know, if things don't feel right, we're very vocal about it. And, it's, and we're very particular about stuff like you're talking, like things, because yeah, jumping genres is cool but if it's not done well it's yeah. it's a mess it's a total mess you know and and if something feels jagged or doesn't feel comfortable at all you know that that bothers us so there's a lot of it's a very it's a time consuming process like going through and just ironing out every little thing so um yeah we're just very meticulous and um yeah we, we, we kind of have our our the way we do things down really well but we're really bad at explaining how how that works <laughs> no it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a natural process in the end i guess yeah that's where it's, the it's just something you know i mean just like anybody creative i mean i'm sure even you know when, when you write or anything it's like it's it's hard to kind of explain like how you get in that mindset and what mm-hmm. you're doing you know because it's so different for everyone and you know a lot of times it just kind of happens which is that's when it's really working is when you're not thinking at all you know and stuff just kind of you know, because I've, I've written sections that I'm like, I don't even remember writing that. It just kind of happened, you know, <laughs> which is, but that's, it's cool, man. I mean, that's, that's when it works. So. 
yeah, I think that's fair to say. There, 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 are, there are moments, there are moments in great music where you just lose yourself, and and that yeah, both for yeah. the listener and, and for the writer. It's nice that that sort of yeah. there's that symmetry there. I want to specifically <clears throat> talk to you about one of your singles. I want to talk about "Fix the Error." Now, yeah. I've played drums for 15 years badly, but I've played, <laughs> and um, so that that Same song. Here. For, so, <laughs> so that song for me was a bit like um like an epiphany. Really, I yeah. so it's one of the, the best pieces of drum I've ever heard. And then you find out like it was three drummers. And then yeah. you do that thing where you try and figure out what well, one drummer part ends and the other. Try. Yeah. How did how did that process happen? How did the drummer's selections that you made happen? How did that how did that process come together from start point to end? I'm so curious. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty simple, honestly. I mean, Blake Blake's kind of had that idea for a while now. He's always kind of talked about it, and and he started working on fix the era in the in the early stages of it. He initially was like, I, I want this section to be the drum cell idea I've been talking about and you know being the band we are we're like yeah let's go for it you know we'll um you know let us know what drummers you think and and we'll kind of go from there and there was a few drummers we had in mind but those were like the the ones that we were all very interested in, in interested in and uh he reached out and they had they all said yes but you know we wanted to to get people that you know we either were really good friends toured with a bunch or or someone like I mean, like Kenneth Shock from Candaria, for instance, is somebody that, you know, I think we all kind of grew up listening to Candaria and, and kind of obsessing over his drumming. And, um, you know, poor Noy, like really, I think it's cool to have him on it because he was such a, a helpful uh, person in regards to Colors One. He was like a huge. Yeah, he advocate. loved the album, didn't he? He gave yeah, an interview yeah, about it. Yeah. It was his album of the year. Yeah. So it was really cool to kind of, you know, we toured with him back then. And, you know, he's, he's such a good dude and yeah it was cool to have him be part of it because of that and Naveen you know we've been touring with him god since he was a teenager you know you know we for 16 17 years probably and he's just a phenomenal musician so yeah it came together really quickly and we didn't actually have the solos to where we were almost done with the record and Blake you know it's like I got him and you know and there it's not there was no tweaks we were like yeah it's perfect you know it's great and the way I, I think one thing I really like about it is I, I love the way that Yen's the guy that mixed her album, the way he mixed it. When you listen to it on headphones, it sounds like they're in a room together. Like he did a really cool job with that. Like rather than just randomly placing, it sounds yeah. like, you know, one, you know, it sounds like the kits are in different areas. So they're all in, in a room, which I like little details like that. So yeah, it's beautiful, that was a beautiful nice little together. icing on the cake. Yeah, the nice icing on the cake. Yeah, so I, it just it's just sort of moments like that are just massive for like the sort of music nerds like me because I'm, I'm a Dream Theater fan. I love Mark Portnoy. Uh, I remember watching him. Um, I remember watching him play with Avenged Sevenfold, and he was just yeah. throwing a drumstick to back and forth <laughs> between him and the him and the him and the roadie at the side and just catching it. Just uh, just a, a, a mystical musician. Um, so yeah. having that sort of moments bringing it together. Um, I wanted to I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Um, about about the genre as a whole because you, you touched on something a little bit there when you talked about you want to prove yourself again on colors mm -hmm. two and when you came out in colors one that was kind of like a little bit like you're breaking out party do you know what i mean um yeah. and we talk about that comparison between those two so i did a little bit of research um in 2007 um the big albums that prog slash metalcore albums of the year were machine as the blackening devin townsend ziltor the omniscient dream theater systematic chaos dillinger escape plans oil works and now you've got 2021, you've got bands like Periphery, you've got bands like mm -hmm. Oceans of Slumber. Um, what are the biggest differences in the genre that, that, that you've sort of like, you went away from a little bit in terms of the concept album stuff that you're going back to with Colours. Now you sort of return to that prog metal core, um, that prog metal core stylings. How has the genre changed since since 2007? What's different? You talk about proving yourself. Is there an element where you've, you've the, is the competition for Between the Buried and Me? Is that what it's sort of like? Is that the no. ambition there at all? No. We, we've never felt competition. I mean, honestly, I, 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 I'm a huge believer in, you know, I love music. I, I love mm -hmm. bands and, and I'm, I'm a, if a band's good and I enjoy them, I'm going to, I'm going I'm to talk about it. You know, it's not like, I'm like, Oh damn, they're good. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I love, I, lo I love playing with bands that are really good. I mean, for instance, we toured with, with Devin in Europe, which I'm a huge fan and, and Leprous was on the tour at that mm -hmm. point. I'd heard of them, but I never heard them. And I, you know, I became like a, a diehard fan during that tour. Every night, I was just like, "Oh my god, these guys!" And they were playing before us. And you know, naturally, I was like, "Holy shit, we have to follow this. These guys are phenomenal." But it's like, 
no this is awesome it's awesome this exists it's awesome that this this band is so fucking good and i didn't know about it you know it's it's, <laughs> it's cool and i mean as far i don't know it, it's tough to talk about like this the scene or i mean we've never mm. really felt part of like one particular group um i don't know i mean it's it's constantly changing i mean i think now more than ever it's definitely more kind of straying away from the extreme metal side of things and more just on the on uh i guess more pop sensibilities with a lot of the bands which is fine i mean it's it's obviously whatever your taste is um but i don't know it, it's tough to i can't say that i'm just like the prog scene i don't even know what that really is consist of you know because that definition so it's kind of thrown around now um but yeah i mean there's so there's so much good music still yeah. and, and i think bands are still really pushing the envelope and um i wish i had bands in particular on the top of my head right now but besides lepers <laughs> they're all they're no. always doing i they're they're cool man i i think it's cool because i like bands that you don't know what to expect with with their albums you know I don't know. I, I get bored when it's like, oh, okay, they're doing that still. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. And, they're, not, and they're, they're one of those bands that, like, when they do something new, it's like, oh, it's, it's different. You're trying something new. And that's exciting to me. Same with Devin. I mean, I think there's a lot of people like that. Yeah. I think, I think, that's, I think that's fair to say. You, 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 you don't want to be put in a box. You don't want to be defined by a yeah. certain thing. And there's, there becomes a narrative. And that's been where... our thing since day one. We've just, we love that we kind of fit in different places. You know, we've been able to tour with bands like the deer hunter or fucking children of Bodom or cannibal corpse, you know, yeah. and like all these different dream theater, you know, it's cool that we can somehow kind of weave our way. I mean, we never really feel part of anything, which sometimes can be weird, but the positive of that is like, we're able to kind of weave our way in and out of all these different types of tours and bands and, and hopefully, came some new fans in the process so. yeah I, d I definitely i definitely think that and and i think really when you talk about metal music in general extreme music we talk about the podcast and every couple of months we think to ourselves surely the lines here now <clears throat> in terms of musician yeah. ability and it just the ceiling just keeps getting higher and higher and higher um what and, and then you, you hear the new arch spire and you're like what the you heard that man <laughs> i haven't i haven't oh, yeah. have to check that out there's, it's like there's... Te it's like tech death metal it's they're awesome but yeah they're it's it's ridiculous it's like in inhuman shit you know <laughs> well, well that's the thing we reviewed a, we reviewed cool. a band very similar to that we reviewed a band called Ophidian Eye a couple of months ago mm -hmm. and they released a, it's tech death same sort of thing and yeah, every yeah. every couple of months I think that we've reached the the limit of what fingers yeah. can do on a guitar and then there's yeah. like four dudes from like Minnesota or something that have just changed everything and these guys are from like yeah. Scandinavia and they're just unbelievable yeah um it's and crazy. It, just, it just happens over and over and, we and learned, over again and we learned that we learned that early on because when we were young like the early days we you know admittedly we were like all right we gotta show what you know what how yeah, of course play, yeah, you know? yeah and as we've gotten older we're like okay we're we're not trying to do that. we're just trying to write some good songs you know obviously our music is technical here and there but yeah they're it I feel like so many bands are like, yeah, well, we're going to do this. And you, you guys can't even, you can't even come here with us. And we're like, that's fine. I love, I love that's how crazy. you said our music is technical here and there and you lead singles or drum solo. I, I've just got, I've got, <laughs> I've got so much time, but that's technical here and there. And it's like an error in too many. Yeah, but the cool thing, but like fix, fix the error, for instance, even though like, yeah, technically there's like some crazy stuff on it, but it's a pretty, I mean, it's song, as far as song structure, it's a pretty, yeah it's a pretty simple song like as far as song structure you know, it's just kind of interesting along the way and I, th I think that's what's something that's gotten more exciting to us as we've as we've gotten older is like you know crafting these these interesting songs that that can be catchy yet yeah. they can be odd and you know kind of take you for a little ride here and there and so yeah so uh, talking about the, the way that you sort of write those I was curious because you, you, you've got the, the metalcore aspect on certain mm -hmm. bits, you know, there's the screaming, there's growling, and then there's moments where we're just slipping away. There's, there's a bit that felt like a folk song about halfway through the album. I was like, where have I been taken here? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's this sort of like jazz Latin bar. There was a clave in the, the second song, just this Latin drum beat. I was like, what is happening here? Um, yeah. you talked about you talked about it coming naturally when it comes to the, the other side of things, like the metal elements, the, the quote mm -hmm. unquote standard tropes of prog metal. Do you feel yeah. like um, any, ob you, you might just be like, no, next question. But do, is there any obligation that you feel at all 
to sort of every so often bring it back to the blueprint, so to speak? Or is it like a, um, I don't know, just a fluid process entirely? For the most part, it's fluid. I mean, there has been times in our career that we're like, shit, should we, should we try to be a little heavier here? Or, um, but I don't know, it's something we don't really think about. I think it's just however we're writing in that moment. You know, for instance, for me, I go through phases where I'm like wanting to write either heavy stuff or not heavy stuff or write on a keyboard or write on a guitar. Like I just go through these phases and, you know, with this new record, I remember when I was writing, I was real, I, I kind of had a metal itch. So a lot of this, you know, a lot of, I was picking up a guitar and writing, yeah. you know, death metal riffs and stuff, which I hadn't done in a while. And then I kind of, I got that itch out because I'm now I'm kind of moved on from that. But, um, yeah, it's weird. I, I think naturally we were just kind of all in a place and it might, it might be our circumstance too of last year. I think there was, it was an aggressive year. <laughs> and, um, That's bad to say. yeah. Um, I don't know, but we, I, don't, I wouldn't say we think about it too much, but it is, it is in our DNA, you know, and I think, yeah. you know, it, like as much as, you know, there's been moments where I'm like, oh, I want to scream less or any, or stuff like that. Like the second we're writing and, I, I put that scream on so I'm just like oh that's that's BT Bam you know that's our sound you know there's like yeah, certain course. things that like bring it back to being us and we don't want to really we don't want to alienate that unless it's just something we hate which we don't we we really yeah, like we, we we like the aggressive side of, of music and um but yeah you try not to think about like expectations I guess and what people people want um because it will get in your head you know, the, the thing about an album is that it's a capsule of, of you in that moment and you want to write, you know, honestly for how you're feeling in that moment. And, and I think that's why our albums are so diverse is because the way we all write changes um, over the years. And, you know, like, like you said, the, the, there's a, a little folk thing in the song, you know, there's, I forget who wrote that, but, you know, there, we're all kind of like, we, we like trying these new things and, um, you know, and, and it changes and, and, and I think the coolest thing about like when you're talking about a writing process is we're really good at feeding off one another. Like for instance, if somebody writes a part of a section and you know, I hear it, I'm like, Oh, this little chunk, this, this chord progression, I kind of hear to something else. Like, Oh, I could make that, that a totally different thing. Just this, the same chord progression. And it kind of, you know, it gives it new life and, and it makes the song more interesting because you can put, you know, because it has the same four progressions, then it can t turn the song into something completely different. And there's there's so much of that. And Dan, in particular, is really really good at like taking like stuff that someone writes and kind of bring it to a you know a totally different world. Which I think that's a big that's a big trick uh, that we do. Is just you know, I mean, answer the sky. People always talk about the bluegrass part. Yeah. Um, it, it's just the chorus. Just in you know it's the 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 chorus chord progression is just as bluegrass and i if i remember correctly paul was just messing around playing it like that and, and we were like that sounds cool How, what is that and he's like oh it's just the, the chorus you know on acoustic <laughs> kind of play and we're like dude let's try to work that in you know it's cool so it's just, it's just trying to be cohesive and not yeah. random like you know you have to be musical as well so it's it, that's the fun that's the fun stuff I, I love writing because of that because you don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen yeah I, I loved i loved listening to the album and hearing that sort of thing there's a your final song which is 15 minutes long mm -hmm. and it starts off just really heavy and up tempo and fast paced and then yeah. by the end there's that little bit that sounds a little bit like a harpsichord and then comes back in yeah. into this final sort of combination it's like when you're watching a film and you're kind of figuring out who the murderer is 15 seconds before it's revealed <laughs> and it was like, like oh that, that's yeah. that that's the bit from here and, and you sort of like yeah. piecing things together i love the i love that music yeah there's can some do there's that. some little yeah there's some little uh, easter eggs at the end of that song i forgot about that yeah yeah and some i wanted throw, to i wanted to talk about that a little bit um the easter eggs specifically then we'll get on to our lightning round um you mentioned that there are various easter eggs if you're a diehard uh, BT Bam sort of fan you're going to immediately sort of pick up on um, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you said everything appears full circle when you were talking about these um, these easter eggs in an interview and it says in that case then I've got to ask does that imply that Colors 2 is a two-parter that we've now closed the chapter on or does the easter eggs imply perhaps that there's a Colors 3 or is that even no I hope not I don't want to do this again <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't want to do it again just so I have to explain in interviews why we did a third one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's a fair question. That's a fair, if we're having this conversation in four years about more Easter eggs, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. take it back. Don't worry about it. No, that, yeah, we just wanted to, you know, that was something we talked about when the idea came about. It's like, yeah, we have to, we have to incorporate some things here and there, but we don't want to sit down and listen to Close One and recreate it. You know, we want yeah, we wanted, course. we wanted this new record to really stand on its own and, and you could even not like Colors 1 and hopefully like Colors 2. You know, obviously we've we've changed quite a bit since then. But yeah, the little Easter egg things, it's just, I mean, we've always done callbacks. Like even if people don't notice it, there's a lot. They're like, there is even callbacks now that like, like Dan will be like, oh yeah, you know, that that was in this song, like something we're playing on tour. I'm like, oh yeah, I totally forgot that's even the same part. You know, we, so we've always kind of done stuff like that. But um yeah, we made some real subtle ones on the new album, and, there, and then there's some pretty obvious ones that we wanted to do. Um, and lyrically, I made some kind of obvious ones just for for the fans' sake. I think I, th- I think it would be cool, you know. But yeah. we didn't want to, you know, cover a song or anything. No, <laughs> no, of course, of but course. But yeah, that's just something. That's just something fun to do. It, it's fun to kind of like. It's challenging. It's challenging to do it tastefully and and make it work within like a new song and yeah um, yeah i think i think we did a good job i like that i like that you sort of create any sort of little games and challenges to yourself yeah, yeah. i got a lot of time for that it's like um so you always watched the, the last dance you know michael jordan talking about like inventing things to be angry I about before started, games i just started that actually oh yeah. mate, it's the it's the best documentary it's, ever seen it's my life. really good yeah yeah, yeah. it was he, actually because we're he's on a lunatic. Tour. it was it was uh, on a in a dressing room the other day i watched like three episodes in a row i was like oh, this is great it's, it's really, really good. I'm a massive basketball yeah. fan anyway. I'm a massive Michael Jordan guy, yeah. like 90s and all that sort of stuff. But just yeah. watching it sort of laid out in that way, really was sort of impressive. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for, for sort of giving your time. We've got one more round for you. Yeah. It's a, a lightning round. So Uh-oh. what happens is you've got, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm um, bad we've on got, my toes. We've so <laughs> <laughs> got 20 quick fire questions. Um, the, the game is just answer them as quickly as you can. And we've got a scoreboard. And I okay. think the qu- the quickest one was with Chris, and I think I answered every question in around a minute forty, a minute forty five, which is it's pretty impressive as, as as things go. They're not difficult questions. I'm not going to ask you know okay. sort of like scientific theorems or anything like that. But we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see how we can go. Okay. So right. whenever you're ready, we'll make a start, and then uh, that'll be us. All right. Let's All right do it. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Starting the timer now. Pizza or pasta? Uh, shit. Pasta. <laughs> Batman or Superman? Batman. Winter or summer? Winter. Early mornings or late nights? Uh, early mornings. Favorite gig you've ever been to? Oh, shit. Uh, Nine Inch Nails. Oh, nice. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Chinese food or Indian food? Chinese. Tom Cruise or Tom Hanks? Hanks. Nice. Hot dogs or burgers? Uh, vegan burgers. Nice. Uh, favorite favorite gig you've ever played um shit that's god now this is <laughs> these are the questions i'm terrible at. yeah yeah <laughs> uh i don't know man uh that's what comes to mind i don't pass okay lord, <laughs> lord of the rings or harry potter neither books or I've films seen either Oh, uh, oh, oh, films. I haven't yet. Man, best musician in the band. God, that's tough. Because you have technical ability. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll say Paul. Okay. Night out or night in? Uh, night in. Favorite song you've ever written? God damn it. <laughs> like me written the whole thing yeah yeah that, well oh. favorite song you've ever written or had an writing involvement in you can, oh. you can generalize it if you want to that's fine well that's that's a lot i've written a lot of songs mm-hmm. um um i'm bad i'm bad at this it's okay. the intro to, to the intro to colors too <laughs> okay, that is beautiful to be fair. Uh, sweet things or savory things? Savory. Okay, favorite album of all time? Mm, I don't have one. Okay. I'll, just say the, I'll just say the Beatles. 
Okay, okay. Um, I love the Beatles, man. Revolver, amazing. Yeah. Um, five, um, dogs or cats? Uh, cats. Bath or shower? Shower. And finally, best piece of advice you could ever give someone? Be patient. Nice, nice. Okay, two minutes 34. You know, that's not bad. Yeah. That's not bad. Okay. You got to about 15 there, there, questions there was and you were like few, on yeah. pace. Yeah. But you did um you did really, really well. So thank you so much for your time with that. I really, really appreciate it. Um thanks for coming on. Um yeah, man. so that's Tommy between the buried and me. Thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. I appreciate no, it. Have a good one, man. See and you. yourself, thank you so much. Bye bye.